check one, two. Okay. Okay, so hoy hablamos. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, um, じゃあ発表は英語にしますけどなんか最初日本語にすると思ったけど半分以上は日本人じゃないかなってなんか日本人がちょっと英語できるの大体英語できるけどその外国人は多分日本語全く分かんないだからじゃあ英語にしますけど日本語の質問とかあればもちろん日本語で聞いて大丈夫です。Okay, so I'm going to do it in English, but if you have, well, there's no need to say, to say that if you have a question in Japanese, you feel free to ask, but also if you have questions in English, feel free to ask, and maybe I'll answer in Japanese or something. Okay,、um, so. I'm, I've got a while.、Um, I hope it's not too boring. I'm going to make like an、um, intermission in between. And also, there's going to be、uh, another demo presentation after mine. So it's not actually going to be almost two hours. It's going to be like 80 minutes or something.、Um, and I'm not going to, it's, it's not exhaustive. So, Lightning Network,、um, oh, I'll talk about me for a second because, yeah.、Uh, so, I'm Taj Dreja. I work at the Digital Currency Initiative at、uh, MIT Media Lab, which is a cool place.、Um, it started three or so years ago, three or four years ago.、Um, and there's some Bitcoin Core developers that work there. I work there, a bunch of other people work there. It's a cool place.、Um, I wrote the Lightning Network paper with Joseph Poon like three years, more than three years ago now.、Um, and so Lightning itself is sort of like, I have no. Control over it, right? It's just like, yeah, I wrote something, but like, I'm not even really working on it that much anymore. Other people are doing all sorts of crazy stuff, which is cool.、Um, so, I'm working on discrete log contracts, which I'll talk about at the latter half of this presentation. And also, I'm not even really working on that now.、Um, I've been working on cryptographic accumulators for Bitcoin for a number of months, and I'll have a paper hopefully about that pretty soon.、Um, So, but this is hopefully like a good introduction and explanation of like how these things work. I'm actually not going to talk about multi hop payments because that was to some extent covered in previous ones,、uh, but I will talk about the, the basic structure of the payment channels. Okay, so why? Why do we do this? It's really complicated,、um, it's kind of a lot of work. Why do we want to do payment channels, Lightning Network, all this stuff? Why not just use Bitcoin?、Um, And that's a legit question.、Uh, there's a lot of weird conspiracy theories. It's kind of funny because some people really hate Lightning Network. It's like, okay, don't use it.、Um, but yeah, like, and, and there's conspiracy, like, even at MIT, one of the new freshman students was like, oh, Lightning Network's this like, conspiracy by the big banks to take over Bitcoin. And I was like, really? Because I ride a bicycle to work and I never got bought out by big banks.、Um, <laughs> so, anyway, so the, the real reason is scalability, which is. Always been the problem.、Um, so every transaction on the blockchain is held by every node. That's sort of, it's sort of an O of n squared problem, which is not good. And so the first thing anyone ever said about Bitcoin so Satoshi posts on、uh, Halloween 2008, so almost 10 years ago, he's like, hey, I've been working on a new electronic cash system that's fully peer to peer with no trusted third party. And he posts the Bitcoin PDF. Cool. Then the first reply he ever got, anyone ever publicly said anything about Bitcoin, was this person, James A. Donald. I don't know, he's probably still around.、Uh, we very, very much need such a system, but the way I understand your proposal, it does not seem to scale to the required size. So this was the first thing anyone ever said. Pretty, pretty interesting.、Uh, pretty, he, was, he was right on the ball.、Um, so, yeah, how do we scale this? Well, with normal networks like the internet, Uh, so, one, one way to think about Bitcoin or the blockchain is it's one Wi Fi access point for the whole world.、Um, and that doesn't scale very well. I'm sure you've been here, the Wi Fi is pretty good, it's pretty fast.、Um, but if you've been at big conferences, sometimes you're in a room with like hundreds of people and the Wi Fi is really slow because you're all sharing the same air, you're all sharing the same transmission medium、uh, for that data. And similarly with, with the blockchain, you're all sharing the same blockchain. If you want to put a transaction in, you got to wait in line with everyone else.、Um, so, the way you do it in normal networks is you, you break the network up into some kind of hierarchy, right? You have a switch, you've got like routers and switches, and you sort of go between different points that way. So, that if you're browsing the internet, I don't see what you're browsing, right? 
Um, in, in the case of Wi-Fi, I do. Like, if you go to a website, I can listen in. Uh, people are maybe not super aware of that, and, you know, there is TLS and stuff, but if you're making DNS requests in this room, we're using the same uh, SSID. I can hear, I can, I can like, listen in on your uh, Wi-Fi transact, your Wi-Fi data. Um, anyway, similarly with Bitcoin, you can see everything. So the idea is, let's, let's split it up. Let's make payment channels where... The, in the simplest version, uh, two people put some funds into a regular UTXO um, and they can move it between each other without updating that UTXO, right? So the UTXO gets created, but who owns it changes without get that getting broadcast to the blockchain. Um, so the first idea, which is pretty old, predates Lightning, um, is to have incremental payment channels. And these are one way. Uh, so the transactions, uh, I think yesterday with some, we, we, we looked at um, transactions have a lock time field. Um, so you can say that this transaction is valid only after a certain block height or only after a certain time. Uh, so you could use that to make a sort of rudimentary payment channel. Uh, the idea is this channel is just a multi-sig outpoint. It's just a UTXO that's got two of two multi-sig. Um, so Alice can fund one of these outpoints by sending coins to a two of two multisig address. Uh, what's different is normally to a, normally multisig is sort of friendly multisig, where I have maybe three keys and I need two of them to spend, or I do it with my friends, or there's an exchange, or you know we're we're friends. Uh, this is sort of adversarial multisig, where we're worried about someone trying to steal our money, but we're creating a transaction with them. Uh, so the simplest would be to have a fund transaction. Your input is Alice's, this is just, you know, Alice's money. She's got a wallet, she's got UTXOs, and she's, in this case, just one input for simplicity. Uh, she says, okay, I've got some input, and I've got an output, and I'm going to send 10 coins to Alice and Bob multisig, two of two multisig. Um, that's really risky. If Alice just sends it, Bob can just disappear, and Alice's coins are gone. Um, before... Alice actually broadcasts that. What she can do is say, I want a, a refund transaction. So I'll create this refund transaction with a lock time set into the future at some point. Um, and this refund transaction, the input is that fund transactions, TXID and index, and it's got Bob's signature on it. So Bob signs the refund transaction. So Bob says, yes, I'm okay with this going, you know, I don't have any coins. You're putting 10 coins into an account with us, and I'm okay with you taking all 10 coins back after a week. Um, and, you know, the output here is Alice's address gets 10 coins. So Bob, so this is, so um, the idea is Alice puts 10 coins in knowing that she safely can get them back after a week. So if Bob disappears and never responds, it's a little bit annoying, but Alice knows, okay, after a week, I can broadcast this refund and I'll get my coins back, minus some fees. So it's still a small loss for Alice. She loses the time, she loses the fees to do this, um, but it's a, it's a really small loss compared to if she had no backup plan. Um, on the other hand, this, this refund transaction has a fixed time, and so that means the channel needs to close by that point. Uh, so you, you know, from Bob's side, he can't leave the channel open longer. Um, and what you can do is you can say, okay, here's the fund out point. It's got Alice and Bob's, you know, keys required. It's got 10 coins. And the first transaction could be Alice says, okay, I'm going to sign a transaction where I get nine coins. You get one coin. I'll sign that, send that over to Bob. And Bob can basically consider that paid, even if it's not on the blockchain, right? So this, this fund transaction output, that transaction's been confirmed. It's in a block. It happened a day ago or so. So there's no question about that one. This one, however, even if it's unconfirmed, Bob can say, well, this is just as good as confirmed because I know I can broadcast this anytime I want. Uh, it's got your signature. I've checked that signature. I can put my own signature on it, broadcast it, and it'll confirm. And I know that this is the only way that this can be spent other than that refund that happens in a week. So Bob does have this time window where, okay, I have to broadcast it sometime this week but anytime this week I want to, I can broadcast this, and I'll get that one coin. So I don't have to broadcast it immediately. I can just wait. Right? Bob doesn't sign his side. Bob just waits, and he says, okay, cool, I got a coin. 
one of these 10 coins in this output are mine. Um, and now Alice can send another coin over, right? This is maybe Bob is selling shoes or cookies or something to Alice. Um, and Alice says, okay, the next day, I want to send you another coin. Alice creates another transaction, spending the same uh, fund output. This time, Bob gets two coins. Alice gets eight. Alice signs it, sends it over to Bob. Uh, and Bob says, cool, now I have two coins. So I'll consider this another payment. He, again, does not broadcast this. Uh, and you can keep doing this arbitrarily many times. Arbitrarily many, except, so there's some pretty severe restrictions you can probably see here. Uh, you can't go backwards, right? If Alice created a new transaction, says, oh, well, now it's seven and three. Uh, how about I get some money back? I'll, I'll send you a transaction where you get eight and I get two. Well, that's just the same as this. And it's not credible for either Alice or Bob to try to go back because Alice knows that Bob has this transaction and this signature, and he can broadcast it whenever he wants. Right? So even if Bob says, oh, here, Alice, I'll give you a transaction with a signature there where you get more of the money, Alice knows that it's just going to be a race. Um, Bob, Bob could even say, hey, I, I deleted this. Remember when we said, like, I had three and you had seven? I totally deleted that. Here, we're, let's go back to eight and two. But how can you prove that you deleted this signature that, that I gave you? Right? There's no way to do that. Um, so one of the restrictions, and anyway, in a few minutes, I'll talk about how you actually you know, implement that. Uh, that is sort of how Lightning Network works. Um, so it's, it's restricted in its one direction, right? Alice can keep paying Bob. Bob can't push money back to Alice. So that's a pretty big restriction. The other big restriction is it has a set time period, right? Um, even though Bob knows, oh, I've got these three coins. But in a week, there's this transaction that's currently locked and can't be broadcast. But later next week, it will be viable. And Alice could say, here's a coin, here's a coin, here's a coin. Oh, wait, I'm taking all 10. Uh, so Bob needs to be online. And at some point before the end of that um, timeout, he needs to broadcast the most recent. Uh, the other thing that Bob can do is he can delete these. As soon as he gets, um, as soon as he gets transaction two, he can delete transaction one. Because from Bob's point of view, the Two coins is better than one coin. And when he gets transaction three, he deletes transaction two. He never really needs to store the old ones because he'd rather have more money. Um, Alice would be very happy if he broadcast transaction two, but there's no reason for Bob to do that. OK, so Bob keeps getting these half-signed transactions. Right, There's one signature, uh, but two signatures are required. And the old transaction is useless. He can delete them. And he needs to broadcast one before the week's over. So yeah, so these are the, limita the limitations. Um, also, the refund transaction needs to be built before the fund transaction. And this is a big problem, malleability. Uh, so this is why I think pre-SegWit, even though there were simple designs for payment channels, they never really got used. Um, there were a bunch of malleability problems. You could use um, op check lock time verify to get around these problems. But Op check, op check lock time verify came out like a year and a half before SegWit started. It, it's sort of like once the ideas to make these cha payment channel networks started, um, there wasn't a huge reason to make the like crummy ones. You, you want to just go to the, the good ones. Okay, so the goal of Lightning is to make bi-directional payment channels that can stay open indefinitely. Um, but how do we do this? How can you make this refund transaction, right? Because the refund transaction, you know, if it's timing based, then you're going to have a limited time duration. And how do you delete or revoke these old states? These old transactions where, you know, okay, you've got two, I've got eight. How do I get rid of that? Um, so there's some new timing based opcodes that got put in that help this. Uh, that you couldn't do this without that. Uh, so the one that's really big is called op check sequence verify, which is sort of confusing. It doesn't seem to have anything to do with timing at all. But what it ends is it's a relative lock time opcode. Uh, what it means is that your input has to be at least this old to spend it. Uh, so it's a, the, the time lock field on a transaction itself says, this transaction is valid after Friday or something. Um, Opcheck sequence verify says, this output is valid after it's three days old. 
Um, it doesn't specify an absolute time. It specifies a relative time. So, and that's actually really important for this. Um, you don't. You might not know when the transaction is going to be confirmed in a block. But you say, okay, and you, you specify number of blocks or number of seconds. Really, number of blocks is easier. And you say, okay, once this this output has been confirmed, you can spend it a thousand after it's got a thousand confirmations. Another way to think of it is, how many confirmations does this output need before it is allowed to be spent? Um, also, since it's an opcode, you can mix it with other things. You can have different things. You can say, well, key A. If you have key A and sign, you can spend it immediately. If you have key B, you can sign, but you have to wait a day. Things like that. Um, so this is a very useful opcode that we needed to make Lightning. Um, yeah. Yeah, otherwise, OK. So what you can do, and the way you can provably, sort of credibly delete a transaction, right? The problem was Bob wants to give money back to Alice. Bob says, OK, well, you know, you were, I was selling you cookies. Now I want to buy flowers from you. So we want to go back to the state where Alice gets eight coins and Bob gets two coins. How can Bob credibly tell Alice, look, I, I deleted this. I'm not going to broadcast it. And here, let's go back to you having eight and two. Um, the way you do it is you do it based on timing. So you use op check sequence verify, and you basically say, well, you can have two of two multisig, and that can happen immediately. Or you can have this other key, and you have to wait 100 blocks. Uh, so the idea is key A, and, and it's a little confusing, because key A and key B are not necessarily owned by Alice and Bob, and key C is not necessarily owned by Carol. Uh, so this is just sort of one, two, and three. There, there's three different public keys. Uh, and the idea is you say, OK, there's two of two multisig. If these two keys sign together, then this this coin can be spent immediately. However, if this other key signs, it can also spend, but you need to have at least 100 confirmations before this can happen. So what this does is it allows these two sort of timing windows where this can spend immediately, and this key has to wait. And then after a while, this key can spend. So any questions about that basic idea of timing? Sort of makes sense? OK. So who, who's got and who generates these different keys? So the way it works is you make a revocable transaction. So instead of, instead of these outputs, you know, you're, you're creating a transaction which spends this 10 coin funding output. right? And instead of just directly sending to Alice and Bob, like we did before, where it says, OK, Bob gets eight coins, Alice gets two, or whatever. Um, instead, you, you make it a little more complex. So this is what is held by Alice, right? Bob creates this transaction. Bob signs it. Bob sends it over to Alice. And this is what sits on Alice's hard drive. And the transaction that sits on Alice's hard drive does send Alice the two coins and Bob the eight coins. But the sending to Alice two coins is a bit complex. It's Alice can sign and, get, and spend these two coins after 100 blocks. Um, or Alice's revocable key and Bob's public key can sign together immediately to spend these two coins. So, and then the Bob's, the Bob's coins, it just goes directly to Bob the same way as before. That's what is held by Alice. On the other hand, there's sort of a mirror image held by Bob where this is the transaction that Alice creates, Alice signs it, and Alice sends that over to Bob and Bob holds it on his hard drive. And it's sort of the same transaction, but different, right? In both cases, it's Alice gets two coins, Bob gets eight coins. But in Alice's case, Bob gets the coins directly, and Alice has these like timing restrictions. In Bob's case, in Bob's case, Alice gets her two coins immediately, and Bob has to wait in order to spend his coins that are created by this. So what this means is, um, we both have sort of the same balance, but we have different transactions. And we have different ways to reach our money. Um, if I, and, and broadcasting these transactions closes the channel, right? It spends this fund output. And that fund output sort of is the channel on the blockchain. And once you spend it, it's destroyed. So, so either party broadcasting one of these commitment transactions closes the channel. And who closes the channel matters. If um, 
Bob closes the channel, right? He takes Alice's signature, adds his own signature, and sends, Alice gets two coins right off the bat. Bob can get these coins, but he has to wait 100 blocks, so like a day. But then there's this Alice or Bob R key. So the idea is um, Bob creates a private key, pub key, and tells Alice what it is. So it says, OK, it's this key. Um, this is Alice's normal public key. This is Bob's key that he will reveal and revoke. OK, so you, you reveal to revoke your state. Um, in the case when you want to close the channel, either party broadcasts and has to wait. Um, but when they're revoking an old state, Alice gives Bob that Alice R private key. And Bob gives Alice that private, that Bob R private key. And so now the idea is if they broadcast an old state, their counterparty can just take all the funds while they wait. Right? So if, if it's the case where this, let's say this has been invalidated, Bob's holding on to it. Um, Bob has revealed this Bob R private key to Alice. So now, if Bob broadcasts this, Alice gets two coins. Bob gets this eight coins, but he has to wait a day. But Alice has Alice's key and Bob R private key. So Alice can just Alice has both these private keys. Can just sign the two of two multisig and immediately take the eight coins. Um, so that's basically how you keep updating Lightning channels, right? You create state one. Alice and Bob have these scripts and have these uh, public keys that they haven't revealed. They then create state two, where, for example, Alice is sending four coins over to Bob. Or no, sorry, Bob's sending four coins over to Alice. Um, and they create this state two, but before it's like you know, a, a credible payment, they have to revoke state one. And both parties reveal that private key that they were using to like keep, keep this a valid transaction. Once they've re revoked it, once they've revealed the private key, they don't want to broadcast this ever, because they know that if they broadcast their version, they will lose all the money. Um, their counterparty can just immediately spend both outputs. So they don't want to, you know, so they just delete it. It's, it's sort of toxic waste at that point. And you can do whatever direction you want. Uh, so in this case, it's going one direction. But, but really, you can have arbitrary updates where either party is paying either other party, and you can revoke the entire old state. So you know that if they've given you the private key for state two, you're actually, you actually hope that they broadcast state two instead of state three. Even if, you know, so if you're Alice, or sorry, if you're Bob, it seems like, or sorry, if you're Alice, you wouldn't want them to broadcast state two, right? Because you have nine coins here and only five coins there. But really, if they broadcast state two, you know the private keys for both of these. So you get all 10 instead of nine. Um, and that can be done automatically in the software. Your software automatically detects this, says, hey, I have the private key for that. Cool, spend it. Um, so that's the main mechanism for revoking the old states in the Lightning Network channel. Um, so this is kind of cool, right? You've got now two-party indefinite duration channels. Uh, you need to create the channel to pay each other. And it's one transaction to fund to open the channel and takes one transaction to close the channel. Um, if you're cooperative, you don't actually use these transactions. Um, so these scripts are for the case where you're unilaterally closing the channel, right? Where either your counterparty has disappeared or they've gone rogue or something, and you say, okay, well, you're not there anymore, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm I'm Bob, right? This is held by Bob, and I'm gonna close the channel and get my eight coins. I have to wait a day though, which is kind of annoying. Um, if you're cooperative, and both parties are online, you don't have to do this at all. You can, if you're Bob and you say, I want to close this channel and get my eight coins, hey, Alice, can you just sign a regular transaction where you get two and I get eight? Let's just both sign that and, and finish this channel right now. And if we do sign that, we can, we can avoid this delay, but that's the last transaction that can ever be signed in this channel, right? That, even if that's not broadcast, both parties are like, well, we can't continue to, we can't continue with this process because we can't revoke that one. We made a transaction without those, those revocable points in it. And so the channel has to close. Uh, so, but if we're cooperative, we can quickly close the channel without uh, this extra script, which is nice for several reasons. One is it's faster. Two is nobody ever has to know that this was a channel. It just looks like a two of two multisig 
and it spends to two regular addresses, and no one can tell it was a channel. So that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so, well, there's HTLCs that were mentioned. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, this doesn't work. This one works. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, um, this work. Consider the situation where uh, we have a channel open and we transact daily. And uh, so, one way to close the channel is co cooperatively. Uh, and uh, but on the other hand, what happens if you know? Let's say I back up my uh, channel state daily, and then you know I I had some catastrophic data loss, mm -hmm. and after uh, you know uh, after a few days I restore from backup, but you know I don't have the latest state. I have just something from a, a couple of days prior. Now I that's toxic waste. I I can never. You know, uh, transmit that, and if and if you're ad adversarial and you know uh, you know about my data loss, you can just wait wait me out, right? Yep. So, um, so th there's like this huge risk with this uh, scheme. Is this correct? Yeah, it, it is a risk. So, so backups are very difficult to do safely with Lightning Network channels because if you so so the 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 attack, or I don't know if it's an attack. The, the problem is, okay, we're Alice and Bob. Um, we get to state two, and Alice makes a backup on a USB stick. And then Alice goes home, and well, before she goes home, she makes another transaction, gets some money, and then goes home and broadcasts state two because she restored from her backup and loses all of her money, right? Because Bob's software, Alice might say, oh no, this was an accident. Sorry, I just made a backup. But Bob's software is like, I don't know. You might have been trying to rip me off. Um, so yeah, so you the, the the sort of simpler way to mitigate it is to have something online where you keep track of which state you're in. So make make backups synchronously to some other server. Uh, you can do that without you know you can do that without revealing private keys and stuff. But yeah, it is a huge usability issue because if you make a backup and then restore it, you could potentially lose all your money if you're if you're not aware of the current state of the system. Um, so yeah, like extra tools. So there's another tool I'll talk about a little bit later called like Watchtower uh, to monitor for you. So, so there's a lot of things that could help make this an easier experience. Um, but there are these, all these sort of attacks like that where you, you don't want to make a backup of your Lightning Network state. Uh, it's probably safer to just ignore. If you, you know, if you lose all this data, but you still have your private keys, probably safer just to wait because then your counterparty will close it probably correctly and you'll get the money you're supposed to have. Is there is there a way to kind of add a uh, time lock into the mix so that uh, in a way in a way that can be kind of postponed uh, uh, repeatedly so that if I do lose my state at least it times out and after so and so 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 and so many blocks uh, it it does get settled. If you lose the state it um, not really. So there's there's other constructions like L2, which is a paper pretty recently that has a different punishment mechanism that is, I don't know if it really helps if you lose your state. It, it sort of does in that the, the punishment transaction, the justice transaction, is it just gives you the correct state instead of getting all the coins. So it's a bit safer for that scenario. Um, but I don't know if there's any timing mechanism that would... It's it's hard to enforce timing mechanisms on in the channel itself because there's no blockchain to like sync it up. Like all these things could have happened within a second or within a year. Um, so it is it is an issue, and there's like different workarounds. But I think one of the big ones will be having like infrastructure and servers where every time you make a new state, you upload it to some server that you're controlling that you trust at least and saying, okay, I'm at state three. So that if you do want to go home and restore your backups, they can give you state three so that you know what's going on. Um, and that doesn't need pr your private key information or anything like that. But it does compromise your privacy because that server sort of knows what the state of your channels is. Um, so that's probably a good trade-off for most cases. Okay, good, good. Um, okay, so that's, yeah, there's a lot of weird edge cases. Um, 
So I'll, very briefly, the idea of um, HTLC. So the HTLC, I'm not even going to go into depth about how you make multi-path multi pay payments, uh, where Alice has a channel with Bob, Bob has a channel with Carol. Without opening a channel from Alice to Carol, Alice can pay Carol via Bob. Um, and that's with a uh, hash time lock contract, um, where it's basically saying, you could have key A and you know this pre-image, the pre-image of this hash, or you have key B and you have to wait some amount of time. Um, and the reason it's a pre-image instead of a keys and signatures is that broadcasting this, um, if you want to spend this part of the script, right? if you want to spend with key A, you have to reveal that pre-image. And that pre-image goes on the blockchain so everyone can see it. So if you broadcast that and collect that fund, that allows anyone else to collect the funds in, its, in a similar, uh, similar output script. So, which is, it's very similar to the um, atomic swaps that were just talked about by Ethan. Um, but what you can do is you can make some optimizations. Um, so when we were talking about this sort of rev revocation key, where it was Bob's public key and a signature from this other key that Alice makes each state and reveals the private key. Um, you could make this into a hash pre-image instead of a new key, right? So in, in this script, you could say, well, instead of having this Alice signs and Bob's revocable point signs, and it's a two of two multisig, how about just Alice signs and Alice knows this pre-image, and Bob does it a hash each time. That's a lot faster, that's a lot smaller, right? So instead of like a 70 byte signature, you get like a 20 byte pre-image, that's better. Uh, we can go even smaller, though. So there was some talk about fancy Schnorr stuff, and I'm going to go way into that soon. Um, but you can add keys together. So you could just say, well, if I add key B and key C, I'll get, let's say, key R. What's the private key for R? Well, it's just the private, the sum of the private keys. So if you, have, if you take two public keys, add them up, the private key for that sum will be the sum of the private keys. So it's pretty easy. Um, this is actually quite straightforward to do in the code. Um, it's not super useful in ECDSA because this doesn't generally let you do anything that cool. It's because you need to know little b and little c in order to sign in most cases. Um, but in the case that we're dealing with, one party does know both private keys. Right? It would be one party making a two of two multi-sig transaction where they know both keys. So in this case, when you're just revealing something, revealing a secret to the other person, this works. Um, so both parties can know, like, okay, let's say this is Bob's, this is Alice's, and they both agree, yes, this R key is the sum of both of our public keys. And as soon as um, Bob gives little b to Alice, Alice says, good, I can sign for R, right? I can sign with key R. Um, and Bob cannot, because he doesn't know little c. Um, so the reduce script is pretty nice in that it's just key D or key A and time passes. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not like multi-sig. It's just either this key signs at any point or this other key signs sometime later. Um, and so the actual sort of op codes, if you want to do that in the script, is op if, key R, op else, delay, check C, quick sense verify, drop because you have to drop the uh, the delay number. This doesn't because it was a soft work. Then you put in KAA, end if, and check sig. This is actually not how it works in the code. There's a couple little extra things to make it safer. But the basic idea is, OK, you pick which key you want to sign with. And the first key, you can sign immediately. The second key, you have to wait some period of time. Uh, and that enforces that, you know, allows you to revoke. OK. so. When you're making, so scalability within the Lightning Network channel, uh, when you're making all these states, like we just showed state ones, two, and three, but you might have millions. You could make 10 transactions a second. I could pay per second of audio I'm streaming, or I could pay per frame of a video I'm watching, or something silly like that. Um, but you could. And so you're going to have to store all these old private keys, right? Every time Bob comes up with a new private key, hands it over to you, you've got to store them all because you don't know which old state he might try to broadcast. So each time you make a new state, it's 32 extra bytes, not great. That's like O of 1. 
Can we get it to log in? Yes. So you can build a hash tree where you store only log in secrets and recompute any received secret. So I called it Elkrum. It's kind of a cheesy play on words. It's Merkle backwards because it's basically a Merkle tree with the arrows reversed. Um, and this apparently is also a actual, th so a lot of times you come up with stuff and then later realize that someone else came up with it like 20 years ago. So I think it's called like GGM and it's from professors at MIT now. It's like, oh, okay, well that's good because that means it probably works. Uh, <laughs> so the idea is um, you have a root, you come up with a root private key, I guess, it's a, you know, a random number. And then if you want to descend, you can, to go left, you say, okay, I'm going to append a zero and take the hash, and then I'll get to two. If I want to go right to five, I append a one and hash it, and I'll get to five. And similarly, if I want to go from two to zero, I append a zero byte, hash it to go down, append a one byte, and hash it to go up. So this is somewhat similar to a Merkle tree, but it's sort of the opposite, right? Instead of trying to compute a parent by concatenating and hashing, I compute children by concatenating like left and right and going down. Uh, so what that lets you do is you've, you've got a sender who knows the root, right? And that sender has the root and com can compute pretty quickly any hash in this tree. And then you have a receiver who starts getting things. The first thing he gets is zero and he can't compute anything. Uh, and then he can receive one, also can't do anything. Once he receives two, however, he can delete zero and one because now he's able to compute hash zero and hash one himself from two, right? He can do the same descend function as the sender did. Uh, so he deletes those two. And then you receive three, you receive four. Once you receive five, you can delete three and four. Once you receive six, you can delete two and five. And now you only have to store one thing and so these are for all those previous states. If Bob broadcasts state three, you're okay, because you've got the state six secret and you can descend from six to five to three. Um, and that's really quick, just a couple hashes. Um, so you only need to store log n uh, secrets for, you know, to, to protect against billions of different old states. So that's kind of a fun trick. Um, another idea is watchtowers. So the idea of these output scripts, right? You've got key D and key A and time. Oh, it's kind of key D or key A and time. I'm sort of writing the scripts as in like C format because it's a lot easier than the opcodes. Um, the key D is sort of the wrong or bad key where if this execution happens, something went wrong, right? If, if you're spending it with key D, wait, that's not supposed to happen. That means someone broadcast a previous state that was sort of goes against the contract. Um, and that means someone's going to take all the coins, you know, and assert that, hey, this is the wrong state. I'm going to take all the coins. Uh, and I call that in the code. I don't know. I think people, a lot of these things, like you just name, and then that becomes what it's called, uh, the justice transaction. It sounds kind of cool, right? Justice transaction. And you need to be online for these because justice delayed is justice denied, especially in Lightning Network channels. If you do not immediately publish this uh, transaction, taking all the coins, the counterparty could wait it out and get the coins, right? Because this, this time value, maybe a day, might be a week, whatever it is, if you don't take it with your key D and this time elapses, they can then take it with key A and they sort of won. Uh, they, they successfully committed the fraud. Um, so the idea of a watchtower is you can create these justice transactions, grabbing all the coins, as soon as you've learned the private key, key D. Uh, because you know what the TX ID will be, you know how much money is in it, you can sign, you can create the whole transaction. It would be an invalid transaction because the inputs don't exist, right? You're spending something that hasn't been broadcast, so that UTXO doesn't exist, so it's not a valid transaction. But if that, you know, if you're, if you're taking a justice transaction for state three, um, if state three ever were to be broadcast, then your justice transaction would be valid. Um, so you can hand this transaction to a third party and say, hey, look, if this TXID ever shows up, broadcast this transaction and I'll get all the money. Um, what's nice is that you don't, you're not trust, you're trusting the watchtower to like be online and do this, um, but they can't do anything bad. They can't take the money themselves. And in fact, they can't even learn what channel they're watching for you um, because you just tell them, 
hey, look for this TXID, which probably will never show up. Um, given that TXID, they can't figure out which channel would, would create this TXID. Uh, so if it does get, if it does happen and they do broadcast the justice transaction for you, then they'll see what the channel was, right? Then you lose some privacy. But in most cases, it's just sort of a backup defense mechanism and they won't see what happens because the channel will close correctly. Um, and then you can just tell them, okay, you can delete everything. So this is a nice sort of preserve, privacy preserving thing. Um, and there's research about that. I think there's talks about this at Scaling Bitcoin tomorrow. Um, okay, so maybe like a quick intermission and then I'll talk about discrete log contracts or we can do questions as well or, hmm? so do you, no, or, okay. Um, so what if a watchtower colludes with your, uh, or with the other party in your channel? Colludes to do to uh, not transmit the justice. Yeah, the that, so that's that's what they okay. can do. They don't need to. I mean, they could collude. Uh, they, they, you know, that's what they can do. They can just turn off and not broadcast anything. Yeah. Um, so I think a good mechanism is to give it to a bunch of different watchtowers. Give it to your friends. You know, have have your friends' wallet keep justice transactions for your wallet and vice versa. And then basically, if anyone is online and watching, then you're safe. Um, but yeah, they, the, there's no assurance that they're going to do what they say. So it requires trust. Yeah, you're trusting that they'll do this. Uh, but it's, you know, you still have the privacy and really you, sh you can just run your own server and not use a watchtower at all. But it's a, it's a backup thing that you're trusting will stay online. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, one thing that I was kind of wondering about with um, the number of states so currently, as my understanding is, uh, you pretty much need to ho hold the revocation pr pub key, uh, private keys for uh, all of the previous states mm -hmm. uh, in your channels. Uh, well, and I'm just, I'm just wondering, is there any way to kind of like compress that or? Yeah, I just, I mean, that, that was this. Okay, all right, so that, that right. would, okay. That so, would basically solve that problem. Yeah, yeah, in that if, you know, you're, you're, you've got a store Seven pri private keys, but if you just store this one, you can recompute. As long as both parties are using this system to generate their private keys, um, okay. they can store log n. So then you, you have like minimal data storage. That doesn't help the watchtowers. The watchtowers you'll have to give like O of n uh, signatures. But for, for your own channel, it can be very small. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So we'll do like five minute break and then go to DLC. Cool. Okay, like five minute break. Or two minutes, I don't know. <laughs> five minutes break. Okay, so I will talk now about smart contracts uh, in Bitcoin. So there's a very, uh, you know, based on Lightning Network, um, there's this idea, I wrote about it last year, I guess called discrete log contracts. And these are smart, in, smart contracts in Bitcoin that use uh, a lot of the concepts from Lightning Network. And most importantly, they use a lot of the same code. So I don't have to program as much new stuff. Um, there's still a lot of new code though. So it uses this kind of anticipated signature that I guess I came up with and I'll talk about that. Um, but it doesn't require any change, consensus changes to Bitcoin. So you can use this now. We have demo software. Uh, other groups have demo software that they'll show after this. Um, you can just use regular ECDSA. The anticipated signature itself is a Schnorr type signature, but it sort of happens offline um, and then allows a regular ECDSA signature to happen. It would be even better if we had Schnorr signatures in Bitcoin to, to do discrete log contracts. It would allow it to be more private and, and just better, um, but it works today. So the idea of it is, I want to make conditional payments. Uh, another way to make, another way to say conditional payment is to say bet. Um, and from my, like I'm not a finance person, but working in Bitcoin for a long time, you sort of start learning about finance. And it seems that finance is mostly about bets, um, but they just don't call them that. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> like insurance, for example, is very clearly bets. So when I get car insurance, I bet I'm going to crash my car. And then the car insurance company says, I bet you won't. And then if I crash my car, I win and they have to pay. Um, and if I want health insurance, like, bet I'm going to get cancer. And they're like, bet you won't. And they're like, hey, hey, I got cancer. I win. Um, sort of mitigated winning there. Um, 
But really, it's just contingent on some event, whether it's me crashing into a tree or some horrible tumor. Uh, there's some event that happens that determines who pays whom, right? So in the simplest example, we'll talk about betting on the weather. Uh, so it's a little bit rainy today. And in this example, Alice and Bob want to bet on tomorrow's weather. And Alice thinks it's going to rain. Bob thinks it's going to be sunny. So they bet, OK, we'll both put in a Bitcoin, or we'll both put in half a Bitcoin, I guess. And um, Alice gets the coin if it's rainy. Bob gets the coin if it's sunny. The problem is uh, the Bitcoin blockchain does not have op weather. We have to stop fork in op weather so that we can know what the weather is. But you can see how it's funny. It's like, wait, the Bitcoin blockchain doesn't know about the weather. And how, how could it, right? It just knows about, like, you know, stuff in Bitcoin. Uh, so, so I would say Lightning Network is a simple script that enforces that it's the most recent transaction, right? Um, that is a smart contract. But it's a smart contract that only deals with state from the system itself. So it's sort of an internal only smart contract where all the data, all the keys, all the information is generated by the channel itself. There's no outside information coming in. Um, and that's nice because that's really clean and easy to implement. Um, if you want some kind of external data to come into the system, like the weather, you're going to need what we usually call an oracle. Right? You're going to need some mechanism where like, the real world gets into Bitcoin. Um, so one mechanism where real world gets into Bitcoin is mining, which is sort of like, OK, you have to pay money. You have to you know, expend electricity to get this thing. Uh, but most of the rest can sort of operate on its own without real world uh, things going in. Um, so the simplest mechanism for doing this oracle would be like a two of three multisig. Uh, transaction. Actually, a simpler, I think I have it. Yeah, you can do two of two, which is no Oracle at all, where you just say, OK, Alice and Bob make a two of two multisig uh, output. And they agree that uh, if it rains, Bob gets the two coins. Or no, if it rains, Alice gets the two coins. If it's sunny, Bob gets them too. And they both have to sign off on it. If they're friends, it works. But uh, you know, Bitcoin is the currency of enemies. And so this does not really work, right? It's if you're friends and you want to bet, it's just like making a bet with your friend. You say, hey, I bet it'll be rainy. And then it rains and you say, hey, pay up. Uh, but it's totally based on trust of your friend. Um, it's also, if you're doing it anonymously, the rich players have an advantage because they can wait out the, the poorer players, right? They, they're saying, I, I'll wait. You know, I, may, maybe I lost this bet, but how about we just, you know, how about instead of you getting the one coin, you get like 0 0.8 coins? That's fair, right? It's like, no, the bet was for one coin. Well, OK, I'll wait. Right? If we both have to sign, I'll wait a couple years until you give up and, and accept the 0.8 coins. Um, so you could have some kind of third party to decide this in the case of a conflict. And this would be like a two of three multi-sig oracle. And I think there's some companies that do this kind of thing. Um, so there's three people, three keys, Alice, Bob, and Olivia. Olivia is the oracle, who's supposed to be sort of impartial. They're the weather station. Um, and if Alice and Bob are chill, they don't have to use Olivia, right? They can just both sign without contacting them. And then the two of three Alice and Bob portion activates. So it does rain. Um, and Alice and Bob both agree, yep, it's raining. They sign. We're good. Um, however, if Alice and Bob start fighting and disagreeing, or one of them is unresponsive and just disappears, then they can ask Olivia to sign. The problem with this is that, let's say it's sunny, and Alice tells Olivia, hey, it's Alice. Say it's raining, and I'll give you 0.8 coins. Right? Alice is going to lose everything. She lost the bet. But if she can influence the oracle to say the wrong thing, she can recover some of that money. And from the oracle's point of view, there's a very clear incentive. I'll get 0.8 coins if I say the wrong thing. Um, so this is pretty tricky. right? This is not, this is not like trustless blockchain, you know, anonymous Bitcoin dark market kind of thing. This is like regular old financial system here. Um, and this is how things work with um, you know, insurance and different agreements and stuff. You're basically trusting things. Um, so two of three, the, the issues here, two of three multi-sig oracles are interactive. Um, they know, they, not only do they know every contract that's occurring, they decide the outcome of every contract. So they're, they're very much involved. And 
that's a vector for attacking and like making them bribing stuff like that. So they can also equivocate. So Alice, so Olivia could sign it's raining in this contract over here, and they could sign it's sunny in a different contract over here on the same day. And how are you going to know? Um, maybe people could publish this, but it's it's a very difficult thing. So it'd be better if the oracle couldn't equivocate, if they had to stick to one answer. There's maybe ways to do that. But even better would be if the oracle never saw the contracts. So I think that's like the important part of discrete log contracts is that the oracle has no idea the contract exists. That would be really cool. But how do you do this? OK, so remember the revocable transactions, right, where they have this Alice revocable and Bob public key. We're going to use the exact same scripts as regular Lightning Network channels. Uh, so there's these two, same as before. Um, but before I get into how we do this, I'm going to talk about a lot of uh, elliptic curve math operations, which I don't know if we've gone into the same, like some of this should hopefully be kind of familiar. It's like multiplying by G, and there's no H in this one. Um, but I'll go into a bit of detail. So in elliptic curve signing, you've got two types, right? So if you're in the code, you've got sort of two different types. You've got what I'm going to call, you know, what, it, what are, I'm going to use lowercase letters for are scalars, and then uppercase letters are usually points on the curve. Um, and what operations can we do with these things? So scalars are just regular old numbers. Uh, usually they're modulo some big prime number, but they are, you can, you're familiar with scalars, right? You can add them, subtract them, multiply, divide, do whatever you want. They're just big numbers. Um, and it's very efficient to add and subtract, multiply, divide. So easy. Then you've got these points, and they're these, these are the weird ones, right? They're points on a curve. You can add them, right? And the way you add them is you sort of draw a line between them and extend that line and see where else it intersects the curve and then go down. Um, and you can subtract them. You do the same thing. Uh, you, can add, you can negate them. So you can say, okay, what is minus b? And you just flip it over the uh, x-axis. So you can add and subtract, and that works, and it's fairly efficient. It's a bit slower, but the computer can do it pretty fast. Uh, what you cannot do, it's just not defined, is multiplication and division, right? So there's no notion of point A times point B. It doesn't exist. It's just not defined. And so similarly, since multiplication is not defined, div division is not defined either. There's no A divided by B. There's no way to do it. Um, okay, so that's kind of a more restricted, with a group, right? So it's more restricted. Um, however, if you mix them, you can do this. So you cannot add a point and a scalar, right? That's sort of like in Python or in most languages, like a type error, where you're like, wait, you've got an int and a float. You can't add these. Or you have to cast first, right? And you can't, well, multiplying by g is sort of casting a scalar to a point. But anyway, you, you, you can't do these things, right? You can't mix these two for addition or subtraction. However, you can when you're adding, uh, when you're multiplying and dividing. So you can say, I'm going to take point a and multiply it by scalar b. And the way you do that is you just say, well, what if b was 2? So big A times 2 is just a plus a. And I can do a plus a, right? I can, I, can, I can add points together. So the way I multiply by a scalar is just repeatedly add. So if b is like 3 million, I just do a plus a plus a plus a 3 million times. Um, and there's more efficient algorithms where you sort of take a and then double it and get 2a and then double that and get 4a and so now you have like binary decomposition you've got like all the powers of two of different a's you can add those up and subtract them and you can pretty efficiently multiply um, a point by a scalar i say pretty efficiently because that's actually the biggest sort of cpu usage for all this signature ver verification and signing stuff is multiplying points by scalars uh that's the that's what so if you're syncing up bitcoin that's what your cpu is mostly doing because it's a uh, you know, you're, you're adding points, which itself is a little bit involved, and you're doing it gazillions of times. Um, so that's, that's what takes some time. Anyway, so you can do these things. Um, so here's what you can do, right? You can add, multiply, divide scalars, okay? And you can add and subtract points from each other, and you can take points and multiply them by scalars and divide. Okay, so, and then sort of went over this, but you, you, you pick some random point G, and we call that the generator. And that's just a point that we all agree on. There's nothing particularly special about it. Um, you, it loops back to itself, so like if you multiply G by itself enough times, eventually you'll get back to G. It takes a long time, though. 
Um, and so what I said before, you can add pub keys, right? So a public key and a private key, right? A private key is just a scalar. A public key is that scalar times g. That's all it is. Um, but since you cannot divide points, you can't say, hey, I want to take you know, someone's public key and divide by g and get the scalar back out. You can't do that. Um, so you can take the sum of private keys, and that'll give you the sum of a public key, right, if you multiply by g. So this is sort of the useful property of these systems. Um, you can add pub keys. Um, and that's how, yeah, I explained, you revoke things like that. Um, so we're going to use this to make non-interactive oracles. So in Lightning, what we do is we reveal these private keys, and we add them up in order to revoke this state. In discrete log contract, we're going to do that where the oracle reveals a private key, which then allows a state to be broadcast. Um, OK, so real quick, Schnorr signatures. It's sort of on your shirts. Um, but I don't quite, I don't know who made the shirt, but like, I don't know what D is. So like hash of D and M, I assume M is the message. So like this is on the shirt is sort of like a modified or, or fancified uh, Schnorr signature, I guess. Uh, so it's pretty similar, but there's a couple other things going on. I'm not sure about those. Um, so the simple straightforward version is you've got a pub key, right? Uh, your, your private key is little a, you just make it up, a random number. And then you compute your pub key, which is little a times G. Um, and then you also make a sort of key pair that exists only for this, this signing process. Uh, so a nonce k, which is random, and you call r the sort of public key version of k. Uh, we don't usually call them private keys and public keys, but really it's the same exact format, it's the same exact equation. Uh, you're taking another random number, multiplying by g, you get r. Uh, and this is usually called the nonce for the signature. So to sign, you just compute s, which is k minus the hash of message in r times your private key a. What's nice about this is this is all scalars. There's no point operations in this, so signing is actually very quick. You just take k, which you just made up, and you take the hash of m and r, uh, multiply that by your private, you know, a hash will give you a scalar output, right? It just gives you 32 bytes. Uh, so you take this hash, you multiply it by your private key, which is also real quick, and then you subtract that from k, which is also really quick. Um, and your signature is just r and s. Now, for someone to verify, they're going to have to do some elliptic curve operations. Um, if you multiply both sides of this equation by g, you'll get this, right? So you get, well, s times g equals k times g minus hash of m and r times a times g. Um, what's nice is these terms are all known to the verifier. Right? They know s itself, so they can compute s times g. They know r, which is k times g. They know big A, your pub key, which is little a times g. And then this hash, they can compute themselves as well. Uh, yeah, uh, what do we do? Questions? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. for uh, s, the signature, sometimes we see it in s with k, but actually, Oh, yeah, you can do plus or minus, either work. Um, I think subtracting is faster, but it's almost exactly the same. Like, there's no, there's no difference. Um, I think the difference is like one of them is a little tiny bit faster for the signer, and one of them is a little tiny bit faster for the verifier. And so you you feel like, well, in Bitcoin, one person signs and then like a million people verify. So let's do the one that's a little faster for verifier. Um, but that's the only difference. Yeah, it's totally you can minus or plus same thing because uh, you can invert these. Right, you can invert. I think one of them involves a point inversion where you have to like flip it over the axis. Um, so yeah, they're they're equivalent, and it is confusing because sometimes it's also some of these terms are sometimes a little different and stuff like that. But. Okay, so so this is how you verify uh, the signature, and you say, okay, well, is s times g equal to this? Right, you you take point r, uh, take this hash, multiply the hash by their pub key. Uh, this is a, this is the that expensive operation, right? Because you're going to have to take a new new point, multiply it by a scalar, which is you know going to be pretty big, and then subtract that from r and see if that's equal to s times g. Also, you have to compute s times g yourself. Uh, total random aside, usually multiplying by g is going to be faster because the they will have optimized code for that since g sort of is a common thing to multiply by. You can pre-compute like g two g four g eight g. Um, Anyway, so you, this is how you do the Snore signature. This, and then there's like 
you know, additional fun things you can do. Um, so what I'm introducing here, I think, I don't know, probably someone else came up with it, but then like I haven't read about it, and maybe in 10 years we'll find out someone else found it first. Um, you switch the signature around a little bit. The reason you have this R nonce is so that you can reuse your pub key. I'll talk about that in a few slides. Um, but you can do the exact same equation and say, well, I'm going to call my pub key these two points, A and R. Right? Now it's two things instead of one, but whatever, I'm just going to still call it my pub key. And I'm, I'm going to call my signature S, whereas before it was the pair point R and scalar S. I'm just going to sort of redefine what I call these things. Um, it's the same equation. It's the same thing. I just move R. But the difference is now I can only sign once. Um, because if, with this pub key, I can only sign once. If I try to sign twice, bad things happen. It's a little bit of... A little bit ugly, but uh, <laughs> so let's say I sign twice with this the same R and the same A. What that means is there's going to be S1 and S2. K is the same each time, uh, but the message is different, right? If I sign the same key and the same message, well, they're just exactly the same, so nothing's different, so that's fine. Uh, but the idea is I'm keeping the same pub key, the same R value, and two different messages. So now I'm going to have S1 and S2 that differ only in their um, this this hash. Right, so the, uh, the coefficient of A. And what the verifier can then do, the verifier doesn't know K, they don't know little a, but they do know S1 and S2, and they can subtract them. And then if S1 minus S2 is going to be K minus this hash 1 times little a minus K uh, plus this hash 2 of little a. So I'm, I did the you know, sign change there, um, which is equal to hash 2 times little a minus hash 1 times little a, which you can factor a out, right? You can say, well, this is both of these things are multiplied by a, so I can factor a out, and I now get hash 2 minus hash 1 times little a. But wait, the verifier knows what both of these hashes are. So it can plug those in and say, wait, I can solve for a. That's your private key. If I know S a is equal to s1 minus s2 divided by the difference in these two hashes. I know both of these because you gave them to me. I know both of these because I also, you know, I got these part of the signature. So if you sign twice with the same uh, R value or the same K value for the signer and the same public key with different messages, very dangerous. You will lose all your money um, or you will lose to piracy in PlayStation 3. So this is kind of a fun fact. The first way I learned about this was this is how like uh, the PlayStation 3 code signing was compromised. Um, so Sony implemented this, but always used the same K value because probably someone was reading it and said, okay, K has to be random. Well, let's make a random number and just always use that. Um, so it was, it was random looking, but it was always the same and someone found that out and then they could play you know, pirated games or whatever on PlayStation. Um, this also has happened many times in Bitcoin where people have used the same K value for signatures. Um, I think there was something in like blockchain.info a couple of years ago had uh, a problem with, with nonce reuse. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe, I, they had some kind of problem with, with randomness. And then someone, uh, Joho, who also makes the really nice mempool graphs. I haven't, haven't met him, but he seems like a nice guy. Uh, because he took all the money. He was like, oh shoot, like I can compute everyone's private key here. Like, this is bad. And he grabbed all the money, and he was sort of trying to find online, like, who wrote this software? Because this is bad. Like, you can't use this. And then he found that it was, like, blockchain info, and he gave all the money back to them so that they could try to get the money back to their users. Uh, so, nice guy. Um, but, yeah, watch out for nonce reuse. Um, generally, now, we'll use um, RFC 6979, I believe, which makes K essentially a function of the private key and the message. So you can see if you take the hash of your message and your little a uh, and use that for k, then it's sort of safe. Because if you're, if you're signing with a new message, you're going to get a different k. Um, and it's also got your private key involved so no one can figure out what the k is. Uh, so that's RFC 6979, which is like the basic idea is just, hey, take, make k, set k equal to hash of message and private key. But it takes like 20 pages to get to that. Um, so it's a fairly involved, like, paper. Um, yeah. Okay, so what can we do here with this new redefined Schnorr signature? It seems worse, right? You can only sign once. But actually, for this oracle, signing about whether it's raining or sunny, 
only being able to sign once might be a feature, not a bug. Uh, so maybe we could say to the Oracle, hey, when you're going to sign about what the, uh, the weather is tomorrow, give us your R point first, right? Pick up, pick your K nonce and multiply by G and give us R today along with your public key so that we know you're only going to sign one thing. If you sign two things, we'll, you know, we'll get your private key. Uh, and you can put some money on the same private key somewhere so we know that you're, you've got stake here. Um, so what's interesting, if, if you do that to try to prevent uh, equivocation, you get a lot more. Um, given this pub key, A and R, and a message M, you cannot compute S, right? You can't forge a signature just by knowing R and A. Uh, that's, that's the you know, main thing that gives the security of signatures. However, you can compute S times G, which generally you only compute when you're verifying a signature. But in this case, it might be useful to know S times G. S times G is just R minus the hash of M and R times their public key. But you know these things, right? You know R, you know M, you know R, you know their pub key. You can compute S times G. Normally, this is only done for verification. But in this case, S times G is very useful. S times G is a public key, right? It's a point on the curve. Um, you don't know the scalar. You don't know S. But you do know S times G. This is really just a key pair, like any other public key, private key. Um, and we can use this so that the third party oracle can sign messages and that signature reveals a private key, right? The signature is now treated like a private key and that signature S times G can be treated like a public key. Uh, so that whenever someone signs this message, that, that signature is a private key that then you can use to spend money. Okay, so we'll, interp we'll take Olivia's signature S as a private key. We'll take their S times G as a public key, and we'll sort of mix this signature, this signature key uh, with Alice and Bob's public keys. So we'll say, okay, Alice's public key plus S times G is this contract public key. And Alice's private key plus S is now this contract private key. Um, and so we can do something very similar to Lightning. Whereas in Lightning, when we've revealed this private key, I can now take all the money. Uh, we do the same thing, but the Oracle reveals a private key and I can take the money, right? So in Lightning, states are added sequentially and validity is in enforced by revealing private keys to delete the old things, right? So same as before. Um, in discrete log contracts, you create all the states at once in the beginning. So I put in cloudy, I don't know, but um, you know, there, there's three states this can be, and we're not sure which will happen, but we create all three states at the outset. And then which one is valid is determined by which um, signature the Oracle produces, and the Oracle essentially endorses one of the states. So the Oracle says cloudy, um, now we've got this cloudy private key. We knew, what the cloudy pri we knew what the cloudy public key was based on, we know their public key, we just throw in the message cloudy and we compute the public key. Uh, and now that this private key is revealed, either of us can broadcast, either Bob or Alice can broadcast this transaction and take the five coin, their five coins. If they broadcast the other transaction, so let's say Alice is like, well, I really want nine and broadcast this. She doesn't know the key to take it. And after 100 blocks, Bob can take both. So it's the same script as Lightning, but you've sort of reversed it where the, the timeout case is now the fraudulent case and the immediate case is now the correct case. Um, yeah, so the revocable key can be used. In DLC, timeout is incorrect. And this is sort of nicer timing characteristics in that you, you never can lose money by going offline and forgetting about something for a week. Um, the worst case is you just show back up and you're like, oh, I get the money. Um, the, what you do have to do is you have to broadcast two transactions immediately after each other. So if you're broadcasting you know, this, if you're Bob, you broadcast this, you have to immediately spend these five coins because after a few days, Alice might be able to steal your coins. Um, but that's, that's an, I think anyway, a much nicer timing model where, well, yeah, if I'm gonna do this, I do both things at once. Um, and that's the only timing constraint I have. So that's a lot nicer. Um, yeah, you sweep the output as soon as you make it. No surprises, it's kind of nice. Um, you can do a lot of cool things with discrete law contracts. It gets really complicated. Um, <laughs> but basically, if parties cooperate, you can make these, these contracts within channels. Um, so you've got a regular old lightning channel with 30 coins in it. 
Alice and Bob have their, their respective outputs. And then you say, hey, let's, let's both put five coins into a discrete log contract. Now, this is another two of two multisig that's descended from the top two of two multisig. So this is like a sub-channel kind of thing. And then you build different states from this sub-channel. You could, and now if you wanted to do everything on chain, if like Alice disappears, Bob says, okay, fine, I'll broadcast this. You know, this, it's three arrows, but it's one transaction, right? To close the channel, you broadcast this, you get these three outputs, um, and then Bob says, okay, I'll wait and I'll get my money, and then I'll also be able to close this, this uh, discrete log contract on chain. But if they're cooperative, uh, Oracle signs, okay, it was rainy, that endorses this, you know, Alice gets nine, Bob gets one. And they both can cooperate, and Alice can say, hey, I won. Bob, let's increment my balance in the channel. And Bob can say, sure, you know, you won. Good game. Um, and change the, you know, change the funding, delete, and then revoke that entire state where there's the discrete log contract in there. And now you just get to this next state of the channel where Alice won and has more money. Um, and you can do this as many times as you want. Um, so this seems useful, right? There's like... You open a channel with someone, you can trade back and forth a bunch of different discrete log contracts, make a bunch of bets. Um, the problem is it's actually kind of poor scalability within the channel. So yes, on chain, which is normally what we consider when we worry about scalability, it's great. There's just one transaction. Um, but every time a contract is added or removed, if you have multiple contracts at the same time, they all need to be re-signed. So in this case, there's only two, maybe two or three possible outputs, sunny and rainy. In practical discrete law contracts, you may have thousands um, because probably what people are going to want to do is bet on prices. And so they'll say, okay, for every, it's not just, the Oracle's not going to sign Sunny or Rainy. The Oracle's going to sign what is the price of corn. Um, and that could be rounded to the nearest cent or something. And so there might be thousands of different transactions covering all of these things. Um, and if you've got one DLC here and then you make another DLC, you have to re sign all of this because this TXID changes, because you've got a new output in the transaction. So it's kind of ugly. This would be a really nice use case for SIG hash no input, where you would use SIG hash no input for the sub, the subcontract uh, discrete log uh, for these signatures, because then you're not referencing the TXID of this output. Uh, you, just, you just reference the key. And then when the TXID changes, it's OK. Uh, you wouldn't have to resign. So that would be a nice thing to have. It's, there's ways to work around scalability without it. There's all sorts of different optimizations where you can like, the Oracle could say sign each digit of the price separately and then you can combine things in different ways. Um, but yeah, there's lots of cool stuff you can do. Okay, so towards the end. So yeah, use cases, currency futures, probably the biggest, stocks, sports, commodities, insurance, you know, any kind of, it's fairly general, and then it can be any kind of smart contract where you're you know, making a contingent payment based on some event. Uh, I think probably the biggest would be um, like dollar, we'll, we'll talk about. But so there's, there's all these like stable coins, like, like Tether, I guess, or things like that, which are kind of sketchy, and they're not really cryptographically secure. It's just sort of you're, you're hoping this bank pays you back. Um, with this, you would still be dependent on an oracle to publish the correct price. But that seems like a lot smaller of an ask than for someone to hold on to millions of dollars for you. Um, and what you'd be able to do is so you know enter a contract where I'm depending on the price of Bitcoin, I get more or less Bitcoin. So one person takes the hedge side where I've uh, you know I, I don't actually want Bitcoin. I sort of want to sell my Bitcoin. I'm like virtually selling it. Uh, where if the price of Bitcoin goes up, I get less of them, and if the price of Bitcoin goes down, I get more of them. So that I have a fixed dollar value. And then the other side of that trade is someone says, I want super volatile Bitcoins because I only have, you know, it doesn't, it's been like $6,000 for like months. Nothing's happening. Like I want to like really juice the volatility of this thing. Um, and then if the price of Bitcoin goes up, they get even more Bitcoins. And if the price of Bitcoin goes down, they lose even more of their Bitcoin. Um, so that seems like a market that would exist, right? Because there's some people who want less volatility and there's some people who want more. Uh, so I think that's, you know, one of the first nice things. You can also do like something that would mirror a stock um, where, you know, depending on the price of this stock in Satoshi's, you get like five shares of this stock worth of Bitcoin at the end of the contract. So you can do things like that. Um, 
there's probably all sorts of weird legal rules. I don't know. It's probably illegal everywhere. Don't do this. Um, yeah, sports betting. It seems like a fairly straightforward, like, okay, let's bet on the sports game. And we have an oracle that signs on who won the soccer game or baseball game. Um, it's nice in that you're not, it's non-custodial, right? So currently there's all sorts of Bitcoin betting sites, but you deposit, right? You, you send all your money to them and you hope that they give you the right money back. Um, to me, the word, de the, the button deposit and withdraw, like should not exist anywhere in Bitcoin because that's like the, the whole point is you are your own bank or you're holding your own money. It's like, why am I depositing? Why, why am I now giving you money that you owe me? Um, so you can do that, you know, the same kind of betting in non-custodial states. Um, but like, I guess sports betting is not as, you know, high finance. So we'll, we'll talk about currency futures, stocks, things like that. Um, Okay, so the current state of the channels, as in the current state of the software, is uh, there's Lightning Network, so there's a bunch of different people working on different implementations. Um, I actually like try to sort of keep up, but I don't even know what's going on with it now. Um, there's like Lightning Labs, there's C Lightning with Rusty, there's Async, there's the stuff I'm working on, Lit. Uh, for discrete log contracts, uh, there's MIT DCI with you know me obviously involved. We have software called Lit. Uh, there's also Digital Garage and Crypto Garage working on stuff. There's other people too. There's some like anonymous people on GitHub who are like, hey, I'm working on this software, and like, who knows? So it's kind of fun. You make stuff and you have no idea who's using it. Um, and there's lots of interesting problems left on how to work on these things and how to optimize them and what to do and UI, all these things. Uh, so it's very early, even though like DLC has been around for almost a year, but yeah, it's still pretty early. Okay, so that's the end of mine, and then there's another talk after, but we can do questions now if people have questions. Okay. Thank you very much for the talk. So my question is about the smart contract. So uh, what happens if Oracle doesn't sign? Right. And is there any mechanism to like force them to sign? Yeah, so you, if the Oracle, so the Oracle, can do some bad things, right? They could sign the wrong thing, and if they sign the wrong thing, you just have to go with it. Um, but so the Oracle can also disappear and just not sign anything. So the not sign anything is not too bad. You can put in a time locked transaction where you say, okay, two weeks after this Oracle was supposed to sign, we also have a transaction that just gives us back what we invested, what we put into the channel. And so if the Oracle doesn't sign, it's a wash. We just get our money back. Um, that that's a fairly straightforward. Uh, you can also do things where you like m you combine multiple oracles. Um, it's not quite as straightforward or as powerful as it would ideally be, but you can say, well, as long as these two oracles agree exactly. So, like in the sunny rainy case, we say, okay, we've got uh, you know Yahoo Weather and like I don't know NOAA or something, and we take two um, two public keys from the two different oracles and we add them up. We add those two SG points. So we need the two agreeing SG points in order to execute. Um, so that, it helps to ensure that the contract execute correctly, but it's still, it's still vulnerable to if one of the parties disappears or if they disagree, then you just have a wash transaction. So you say, okay, well, if, it's, if they, did, they, don't, they don't agree and one says sunny and one says rainy, well, we just both get back what we paid, which is, which is okay, right? It's like, well, we, we didn't have a successful contract execution. So there's, there's ways to help against this, but the Oracle is still trusted, right? They are, they probably should, I, I think it makes sense for the Oracle to be like a well-known public trusted entity. Um, I think as long as the Oracle doesn't get to see what's happening, that's not that bad that you have to trust them. Uh, or it's, it's better, I mean, yeah, the idea of like a totally trustless Oracle feels impossible, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so, so I think like the, you know, the idea is try to, box in the Oracle as much as possible. You do have to trust them, but try to minimize that trust. So, but yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? You mentioned that the, in the case of lighting channels, you are computing the states as you progress. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, we have the DLCs in which you compute all the states at the beginning. Yeah. So my question is, is there any middle point in which you have some non-interactivity uh, and uh, flexibility, but at the same time, uh, you have the validity at the end in a non-interactive way? Huh, I 
guess you could. I don't. So I, yeah, I, I think technically you could do that. You could say, well, we we built a discrete log contract with these states in the beginning, and we can sort of add states in later. Um, you could. I don't know what use. I, I I haven't thought of like if you can think of a cool use for that. Yeah, I, I believe that's technically doable. I just haven't thought of a, a reason you'd need to do that. It seems like it seems like the con like at least in normal contracts you sort of come up with all the terms of the contract and then you sign it. And but in some cases you you amend it. Uh, so you could amend this to say you can't delete things, but you could sort of add new things. Well, wait, what if the oracle signs this? Let's do this other thing. So you you could add things on to the end uh, during it. But I haven't I haven't thought of that at all. <laughs> so cool idea. Yeah. Other. So throughout this talk, uh, you discuss these extremely difficult edge cases. Mm. And instead of coming up with some ingenious math or cryptography, you just side with third parties and the very intermediaries that I believe Bitcoin was trying to get away from at the beginning. Um, so really my question is, can Lightning scale as a decentralized trustless network with all these vulnerabilities packed into it? Wait, which 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 one are you talking about? Are the Oracle or the all of them? I mean, you're just littered with like these extremely difficult edge cases. Like, I don't know how to solve them myself either. So I'm not saying that uh, you know it's impossible for Lightning or for these developers to come up with solutions for these edge cases, but leaving them to third parties to trust. Um, I feel like so that's wait, not okay. Which which third parties are we talking? So there's like a like the watchtower thing, I guess, is a third party. So you can just not ever use a watchtower, right? It's totally optional. It's at it's completely a you know backup mechanism. So if you say I don't want to use a watchtower, just you know you have to be online. So you have this sort of liveliness uh, requirement for your node. So that is an that is an additional uh, thing you you know in normal Bitcoin without channels. You can go offline for weeks, months, and you don't really have to worry. Uh, whereas if you have a lightning channel, yeah, you need to you need to watch it because you have that timeout. Um, so this is sort of a hot wallet kind of issue. You can, if you're saying, well, I I think I will be offline, I'm not going to keep that money in lightning. Uh, you know, I'm going to close out all my channels. Uh, it also could be sort of seen as, you know, there are some security issues, and so if you're mostly saving tons of money. Don't save them in Lightning channels. Use that for you know rapid payments and things like that. Where, and then you can close it out at the end. So so yeah, it it has different security properties, but I wouldn't say like you have to trust everyone and stuff like that. It's it's more like yeah, there there's there's more things that can go wrong, but it also lets you do a, a bunch of cool new things. So for mo, you know I think probably my guess in the long term is that. There will be a lot of Lightning Network transactions, but most of the value in Bitcoin won't be transacted on Lightning. So right. total number of transactions is high, but probably total value will be a smaller portion. So just a short follow-up, what should we use Lightning for then? Um, I think in cases where these... So I think the first real use case that would really help is open channels to exchanges. Um, right now, you've got deposit coins, and you just completely give all the trust to the exchange. And so if you instead say, okay, I'm going to open a channel with the exchange, and every time I send coins to the other side, that's a, that's a sell. And when I want to buy, they send coins to me. Um, you know, that, that's strictly better than the current model where you just completely give all the trust to them. Um, so, so it's, you know, there are still security issues, but if you're going from, I completely trust a third party to hold my private keys to, oh, well, now I've got my own private keys, and there's still some security issues if I go offline or I'm attacked. Um, you know, that's that's an improvement. So I, I'm not. I definitely don't say it should like completely replace regular UTXO wallets. But there are cases where it's like, hey, we can sort of take back this like custody thing, which is the same with DLC. Whereas if you want to, you know, do financial contracts right now, it's all custodial. You send your money, you wire your money somewhere, they hold it, and then they decide how the outcome of the contracts is. Thank you. Okay, sure. One more, I think. Did you have one? Oh no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Any other? I can switch. Okay. Or oh, last. Okay. We'll do last one. 
Hi, actually, I come from the exchange, and I'm quite interested about the idea about Lightning Network. You who uh, user deposit into exchange, do you mean like whenever user deposit something and then they buy and sell another coin, exchange should immediately send them via the channel? Because to me, it's like very, very uh, unrealistic. Because in terms of the cost of the maintenance from from the exchange side, it's very unrealistic. If every single user buy something, buy some coin, and we have to like send them immediately via the channel. Uh, why is that? I, I mean, there's no fees, right? So why not? You know, in, in Bitcoin, it, with, with regular on-chain Bitcoin, yes, you can't, every single order, you can't make an on-chain transaction. But but the idea for Lightning, you know, you've, you've got this big central exchange and all these customers have channels with it. And every time they make an order and they sell or they buy, you just update that channel state. And I think that's totally doable on today's hardware. Uh, um, okay, I got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, but it, but there are questions like, when do you open the channel? So if someone opens an account and, you know, wires in $1,000, do you then open a channel with them and put like $1,000 worth of Bitcoin because they might buy it uh, or not? Like, so, so there are a lot of like weird questions about that. Or if they... They deposit, well, deposit's easier, but like when the exchange, when someone comes to the exchange to buy Bitcoins, how much should you open channels? You could try to just open channels to the extent that, you know, if they took all the dollars they have sent us and bought Bitcoins with it, that's how big the channel would be. Uh, there's also all sorts of like weird, you can't push all the funds to one side or the other of the channel um, because then the attacks become risk-free. There's all sorts of, there's like all sorts of complicated things, but there are, you know, useful things I think it can improve exchanges with. Um, and we're starting to see that now. So that's kind of fun. Cool. OK. OK. You. And then you guys are going? OK. So thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll plug in. Thanks. <laughs>